Hello there and welcome to another sociology revision video from me, Ben, at All Sociology. Today, what we're going to be doing is looking at stratification and differentiation still, but we're specifically going to be focusing on social class and whether social class is still important. So as per usual, what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen with you. So you should now be able to see me up in the top sort of right hand corner and you'll be able to see there the menu of what we're going to run through today which is all about as I say social class and differentiation is class still important so I'm hoping this video will be about a 15 minute 15 minute yeah who am I kidding about half an hour job uh, with any luck I'm going to go through an overview of social class so that we're understanding uh, exactly what it is what we're talking about here then we're going to get into the real big key debate, which is about whether social class is still important. And we're going to have a look at a variety of different sociological theorists and what they have to say about it. I'll again, as we move towards the end of this video, I'll cover off some of the sort of 10 key terms that I've done or gone through in this video to check that you're all right with them. And then we'll have a look at a, a bit of a beefy, a bit of a nasty nine mark question all about whether social class is important or not. Now, if you haven't already, please go back and have a watch of some of the... Um, previous videos I've done. So in this series on stratification, I've done episode 12 is on an intro to stratification. Episode 13 is on Marxist versus functionist views of stratification. And 14, which uh, is the previous video, is all about Max Weber and how he sees stratification and differentiation society. So if you haven't watched them already, please go back and have a little watch them. They'll really help you understand uh, more deeply some of the stuff that I'm going to go through in this video today. So anyway, without uh, any further ado, let's get budging into the main part of what we're going to be talking about today, which is social class. So right on the right hand side of this slide, we've got a classic kind of class structure that we might find in, in the UK or USA or really most parts of the world really based on upper classes so that's like you, you know ultimately you're really rich people your kings and queens and your aristocracy upper middle classes so very comfortably off people your lower middle classes quite a lot of people uh, residing in that sort of area then your working classes and then at the bottom there you've got the people who uh, don't work and who probably are in receipt of benefits they are according to new right referred to as the underclass so let's go through what class actually is and in the simplest possible way it's a way of dividing people up into groups based Based on their occupation and ultimately their income and how much money they get paid for the job that they do. Um, as we've got there from our kind of, I've slightly overcomplicated it on the right hand side there, but ultimately you've got really kind of four classes in society, upper, middle, working and uh, underclass, but ultimately you can split the middle class up into quite a few different categories because it's a very big class of people. Now, if you were watching the previous videos, you would have seen uh, that I've covered that the issue of occupation, income and class is really important when it comes to the arguments of functionists who argue that the higher up you get in society is all based on your hard work. Marxists who argue that the class that you end up in, whether that's bourgeoisie or proletariat, is going to significantly um, affect your life chances. And Weber as well, who also talks about socioeconomic status and the impact of three things, class, status and power or party on that. So the, the concept of class is a really, really if you haven't already worked it out, it's a really blimmin' big one in sociology, but particularly in stratification and differentiation. So what are some of the key kind of issues that there are with class? Well, the big one is the fact that there are class inequalities. And these class inequalities will start very early in life. You would have seen from your studies in education. If you haven't covered education or you need to recap about, go back and watch my previous videos. There's uh, three or four on education. So we know that there are differences between ultimately rich kids and poor kids in terms of how well they do in education. But those inequalities continue into later life as well. In terms of the kinds of jobs that people get, the income that they can then get from those jobs, and then the wealth that they can build up throughout their life as a result of that. So there is a big difference in terms of how well people from poorer backgrounds do compared to people from more middle class, richer backgrounds do. And ultimately, what it all comes down to is people's opportunities and life chances they will have in life. Life chances are just your chances of being successful in life. And often we can think about how that your, your life chances can be based on your early start in life, so your education, and then as you go through life as well. But even when we start to think about 
differences not just in terms of education and in terms of um, income and things like that like working class people are much more likely to be ill for instance they're more likely to be victims of crime they're more likely to live in poverty and also like to have a lower life expectancy so it's not just about how much money you earn and class and that kind of stuff it can permeate a much wider deeper aspect of of social life as well so Whenever we're talking about class, it's really important not to lose sight of the stuff that we've already learned. I'm going to go through quite a lot of new stuff in this video that um, you, I, I certainly won't have covered before uh, on any videos and often gets a little bit overlooked, I think, in the sort of the quagmire of, of class because it's a blimmin' big part of the course. But let's not lose sight of what we know already, which is ultimately if you're talking about or writing about social class, there will be a connection to Marxism in there. So whether that's talking about the middle class privilege uh, that you might see, for instance, through um, if we're talking about education or work and cultural capital. So cultural capital, I'll come over and go over this in a bit more detail later, but it's Bourdieu's idea of the experiences, values, uh, language and um, encouragement that you might get from a middle class home versus a working class home. And then also the old boys network as well. Again, I'll go through this in a bit more detail, but the old boys network is effectively the group of people who they are boys because they would have gone to public schools like Eton or Harrow. So all boys schools, then from Eton and Harrow, then would have moved up to the sort of Oxbridge University, so Oxford and Cambridge universities, and from then move on to the high status jobs. And often it's the same group or type of people, very middle class male uh, individuals who end up in this old boys network because they're the ones that get the chances to go to Eton and Harrow or public schools they're the ones that then get the most opportunities to go to Oxbridge and they're the ones then that get the high profile high status jobs for instance in the government and I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go through but so the Marxist view you've kind of got to mention if you're talking about class if you recap and go back to uh, I think it was episode 13 when I covered the new right view of stratification as well you've got some class links in there as well so Peter Saunders argues that the middle class the reason why they are in a better position in the social strata is because they're naturally clever and they just work harder yeah if you want to entertain that you can uh, but also from last video that i covered so 14 was on max weber weber remember says that class forms an integral part of someone's socioeconomic status so within socioeconomic status you've got things like class your status and the power or the party that you belong to in society so class is a really important issue it's something that i've covered um very consciously throughout those previous two videos so please go back and have a look at them if you want to get a better handle on uh, marxists new right weber even the functionist views of um, class and stratification so i'm now going to come on to what is ultimately going to be the the kind of the classic question that you might get asked around social class the cl classic sort of big nine mark mini essay type question that you might get asked around social class and it's about whether social class is still important in society. Now, we know that social class has definitely been important in society because we can go back and think about Marx's time. So Marx was living in you know, pretty much the Victorian time, so 150 years ago or so. And conditions were very strikingly different between the working class. So you can see from the picture there, we've got some, uh, looks like some children waiting to go to work or just queuing up outside their houses or whatever, their slum houses. And then the middle class or the bourgeoisie, uh, obviously um, connoted by their top hats and umbrellas there. So, you, you know, class has traditionally been a very big distinction and a big way that we can differentiate between groups in society, the haves, the have nots, the rich, the poor, the bourgeoisie, the proletariat. But it leads us to this question as to whether social class is still important today, because we don't, we, okay, we do have those extreme differences between extremely poor and people living in sort of absolute poverty and those who are very, very rich and very wealthy. But there is an argument today that actually those those differences have kind of merged together slightly and that ultimately there's this kind of issue of, well, we've got more people now in this middle class and you've got the picture that says middle class, middle age, we are the 99 percent. That This is arguing that the people who now live, live and uh, occupy that middle class of society has actually got to be a much bigger group in society and that as a result, you don't have the massive, uh, huge differences between rich and poor that perhaps you did in Marx's day. Is there a bit more of a blurring of the lines and is there a bit more of a bigger middle class which makes that 
bourgeoisie proletariat distinction a little bit fuzzy so that's the kind of question that we're going to focus on now and ultimately there's there's kind of a couple of views to this there's the view from marxist which is that yeah social class is still important but there's also the views from other sociologists who would say no it's not really that important basically uh, we've, we've kind of done away with class and that everyone's kind of in the middle now so we're going to look at this argument uh, as we go through so let's start off well, let's have a drink first of all because I'm thirsty so hopefully you've got yourself a tasty drink as well because this is going to get quite deep in the next uh, sort of five ten minutes or so but let's go through the Marxist view of social class for Marx, that class has always been a problem in society, and it's the key distinction that separates and causes conflict between the rich and the poor. Now, Marxists today would very much still hold on to this view and would look at the idea that the gap between the rich and the poor is getting wider. So the group of people who have lots and lots of wealth, we sometimes call those the 1%, is getting smaller, but the amount of wealth they've got is getting much bigger. But the people at the other end of society, so the very poor, is getting much bigger as well. So you've got this gap that's growing between the rich and the poor. And actually, if we look at some of the data from a poverty charity like the Joseph Rounty Foundation, that's what the JRF is, by the way, they would estimate that about 20% of the UK is currently living in poverty. So that's a fifth of the UK population that's living in poverty. And I can guarantee you it's not a fifth of the population that are living in extreme poverty. Uh, wealth and luxury. So it's a problem, basically, is what Marxists say. And it's going to continue to be a problem as long as we've got a capitalist system that is based on the accumulation of profit and wealth at the expense of everything else. And we're only going to get rid of this problem, this gap between the rich and the poor, once, according to Marx, once we've overthrown this capitalist system of, of um, the economy, which we work and live in now, with a communist system where rather than people owning things privately and then profiting off them, as we do now in capitalism, everybody would then have an equal share of private property that can make profit and everyone gets a share of the profit. So that's what Marx wanted to see happen. And as I've mentioned already, go back and have a watch of episode 13 on the Marxist view of stratification. It's called the Functionist versus Marxist view. It will be really important for you for really getting a handle on what Marx says and why in a bit more detail than I'm going to go into today. However, Notwithstanding that, I'm still going to cover off some sort of key Marxist ideas as about why class is a problem. And as I have mentioned already, class, according to Marxists, is the main division and cause of conflict in a society. And the reason is, it's because the people who own stuff, and by this what we mean is the bourgeoisie who own the means of production. The means of production are factories or any kind of business or property that can make you profit. Because they always own these things, they always have the power and they're always going to stay at the top of society, which means that things are never going to get any better because the people who have stuff, they have the, own, uh, the means of production, they're going to keep hold of that because the profit is keeping them in their position in society. Now, there's a key word here called false class consciousness. Now, you might think, well, surely why don't the working classes just figure this out and, and sort of get rid of capitalism because clearly they're getting screwed over by it right well the trouble is is that marx uses this concept called false class consciousness and false class consciousness is basically the idea that working class people are unaware and don't know how bad their position in the social strata is so what um what this is and how it works is basically the, the middle classes the bourgeoisie use their power to trick and feed almost like misinformation to the working classes about what their position in society is like. So we all get to think that things aren't actually that bad. So a classic example would be something like, oh, you know, my job sucks, but hey, at least it's at least I get two days at the end of the weekend where at the end of the week where I can have my own time. It's not that bad after all. I'm not really that exploited. When actually Marx would say you're incredibly exploited, you're just led to believe that things aren't as bad as they are. That's what he means by false class consciousness. So that's a bit about classic Marxism. But go back to episode 13 if you want a little bit more on that. Uh, I mentioned Bourdieu a moment ago. So Pierre Bourdieu is a French uh, sort of Marxist, and he uses the concept of cultural capital. So it's not just about 
what you own and those material possessions that you have. It's also about kind of uh, the culture in which you live, this middle class culture versus working class culture. Now, Bourdieu argues that the middle classes are able to sort of keep their position in society through this thing called cultural capital, which effectively is the knowledge, interests, values and experiences that middle class people have that working class people don't get. And it might sound a bit silly, but it's things like knowing a little bit about history, knowing a little bit about art, knowing a little bit about food, knowing how to uh, carry yourself in certain situations that are going to help you or help middle class people to get on better in life and fit in better to that class system that we've got. Now, according to Borgia, having this cultural capital gives you this kind of advantage in life. It gives you opportunities that wouldn't necessarily be open to working class people. It gives you an additional layer of privilege that puts you in a step above the working classes. So both Marx and Borgia, both Marxists obviously, both argue that class is still important. Marx really focusing on who owns the means of production, but Bourdieu really focusing on this idea of cultural capital. So it's not like necessarily things you have and things you can touch and money and stuff like that, but it's about your attitude, the outlook you have on life and the way in which you live your life. Last thing to mention, you can't really sort of get away from this without mentioning material inequality. So I've mentioned some cultural things there, like in terms of cultural capital, material things, material inequalities are things you can touch and you can buy. So middle class people can, because they have the money, afford to buy things that will improve their life chances. You know, even if that is at a very simple level, going back to education, middle class families will be better able to support their children, get through exams through, for instance, hiring them a private tutor, buying them a revision guide, giving them their own computer, those kind of things. So it's all of these kind of things that can help to keep classes still as an important thing in our society because there's such a gap between rich and poor and obviously the consequences that result from that. I mentioned earlier, uh, one of the um, sort of key uh, points of inequality between rich and poor, the middle class and the working classes is this idea that middle class people can occupy what Marxists would refer to as the old boys network. So this is about basically being having the money to afford to go to public school. So public schools are the most traditional, uh, historical, uh, highly thought of private schools in the UK, places like Eton and Harrow. Uh, and when you're able to send your children to those schools, you do get opportunities that other people don't get. You get a better quality of teaching. You get a, basically a better chance to get on in life quicker than everybody else. Now, if you can afford to send your children to uh, public schools, and they are very, very expensive, we're talking tens of thousands of pounds uh, a year, if not a term, then the likelihood is, is that they may well get a good place at university and they will continue to sort of hang out in this uh, group of people that would have gone through the same system that they have. So through public schools up to Oxford and Cambridge universities. And then once you graduate from those universities, it tends to be those people who have gone to those places that get the top jobs in society. So we're thinking there about jobs like uh, in the government, and those kind of things because the people that have been to those public schools and have been to those universities all kind of know each other and classic examples of this would be someone like Boris Johnson or ex another ex-prime minister David Cameron both part of what we consider to be the old boys network because they've gone through that very privileged system of public schools best universities and then ended up in the top jobs in society not necessarily because they're the best people to get that so not necessarily through rational legal authority but maybe because of who they know now rather than what they know and the final thing just to mention in terms of like class and life chances and material inequalities is if you've got money you can afford things that can better help your life and improve your chances of success in life so whether that's private healthcare or having a private pension or for instance, uh, having alternative sources of income, whether that be you know, getting rent from a property, those kind of things, all of these things su would suggest to Marxists that class does remain a very important uh, social, a way of socially differentiating people in our society. So there you go, there's the Marxist argument that yeah, class is still important. Now, I'm gonna take a breather because I'm now gonna cover off for you um, the argument that actually maybe social class is not as important as perhaps it once was, or that maybe it doesn't hold the kind of the weight that Marxists would put onto it. And in order to do this, what we're gonna do is basically recap ourselves about the new right view of social class. So. If you cast your minds back to the previous episode, when I looked at, or sorry, not the previous episode, the episode before that, when we looked at uh, the new rights view on stratification, when we covered off Marxism and functionalism, you may recall that I would have mentioned things like 
oh, well, actually, uh, it's only, you know, everyone could be part of the middle class. The middle class is now, um, it's all about how hard you work. And if you want to work hard, you can do that. So I've just dropped my pen. I'm going to pick that up. So the new right basically argue that today we live in a classless society where anybody from any social background can make it as long as they work hard and get on in society. So they very much follow this functionist idea of society is a meritocracy. It doesn't matter where you come from or who you are or what you look like. If you work hard and you play by the rules, you can get on and you can do very well in society. Now, one of the reasons that they argue that we live in a classless society is because people are so much better off than they used to be. So if you compare, for instance, the, a, a standard working class person today from a, a standard working class person in Marx's, a, uh, Marx's time, very different in terms of the quality of life that we lead now is much better. We have much better life expectancies. We have more disposable income. So even though things might not be absolutely perfect, they're certainly better than they used to be, according to the new right. And one of the things they argue is basically that people have sort of um, progressed and had this sense of social mobility up from the working classes into the middle classes. And they basically argue that people who used to be working class are now middle class as well. And as I say, go back and watch the episode 13 for more information on the new rights view of stratification and, and Peter Saunders and stuff like that. Now, we're going to just bunch on a little bit from the new right because I'm going to mention functionists previously because I'm going to mention functionists previously I'm going to mention functionists now because they share this view of the big idea here if if social class is no longer important it's because we live in a meritocracy where everybody has the same chance of doing well it just depends on how hard you work for it so it's about the idea that work hard and anyone can get to the top of society improve their status through social mobility and this is the ultimate view of the new right and of functionists now we're going to add a little bit more into this because I'm going to focus now on a couple of sociologists who have this view that perhaps class isn't as important as it once was, or that certainly class has changed from what it was like in Marx's day. And the first two sociologists I'm going to mention are Goldthorpe and Lockwood, and they conducted a study, I think this was back in the 1960s, I want to say it might have even been a little bit earlier than that, or perhaps it might have been the 1970s, doesn't matter, they conducted a study about 50 years ago. And what they did was they went in and looked at people who worked in a car factory. It was in the 1960s. I've just written this down. Uh, it was in the 1960s. They worked in, and they looked and looked. Let me start again for crying out loud. They went and looked at people who worked in a car factory who were doing what you might traditionally see as middle to working class jobs. And what they found was that these working class jobs are increasingly being well paid to the point where they said that actually working class people can be described as being affluent workers. Affluent means basically rich or well off. So what they basically found was that working class jobs that were previously quite poorly paid, you know, minimum wage jobs, had actually progressed and advanced into being quite well paid middle class jobs. So this is people working in car factories as like panel beaters and people putting cars together. So traditionally quite low status jobs. But what Goldford put Goldthorpe and Lockwood found in their study of affluent workers is that people are getting paid better and that ultimately traditionally working class jobs have really become actually well paid middle class jobs. Now, someone called Dev Devona Sivine, Fiona Devine, I'm not with it today, am I clearly? Fiona Devine actually repeated Goldthorpe and Lockwood study in the 1980s and she termed it affluent workers revisited. What she basically found is that even though working class people were getting paid a higher amount of money and that were arguably more affluent or richer than they would have been perhaps 50 years previous, there is still this big sense of working class people holding on to a working class identity. So about who they are, how they see themselves, what their job is, what that job means to them. And that's despite those changes in the labour market where we've seen perhaps wages increase, particularly for those traditional middle uh, working class jobs. And also, we've also seen a change in types of jobs available in our society, going from sort of uh, what we call um, secondary industry, called manual jobs where people work in manufacturing. So for instance, like car manufacturing, that kind of thing, like Goldthorpe and Lockwood were looking at over to more service sector tertiary uh, economy jobs, like for instance, working offices, working in retail, working um, on computers or on the telephone, those kind of things. So ultimately, let me just sort of recap this because I re realize I've been sort of blabbing a little bit. 
the first argument from Marx and Marxist is that class is still important. It's, it's a massive distinction between the rich and the poor. It's not getting any better. Then we've now got the argument that perhaps class is not as important as it once was. And that's really the argument of the new right and of functionists who say, well, it's a classless society we live in because we've got a meritocracy. If you work hard, you will get rewarded because everyone's got the same chance of success. And then you've got the arguments of Lockwood and Goldthorpe and Fiona Devine. Both of these types of, both of these two different groups of sociologists are effectively arguing the same thing, that perhaps social class is not as important as it once was because of the way that we now have this role of the affluent working class worker, but bearing in mind that working class people still maintain this identity of being uh, working class, according to Fiona Devine. So there we go. We've gone through the whole debate on whether social class is or is not still important. And I want to hold on to that because as we move through and look at the question, this is going to be the basis of the question that we work through. So we've come to this point now where I'm just going to run through 10 of the key terms that I've covered in this video for you. Start off with the obvious one, the video is on class. So class, well, social class is basically uh, judged by your occupation and the income levels you have in society. It's an incredibly important um, concept for all sociologists, but particularly for Marxists and then also for the new right as well. Income, what is income? Income is ultimately about money you have coming in from any job that you might have or any wages. It can also be income you get from a pensions or from benefits that you might have. So any money coming into you. Wealth is slightly different. Wealth is made up of income, but it's also based on any other kind of possessions that you might have. So including that income and other aspects of uh, possessions you might have. So property, for instance, or any expensive items that you might have around you. Life chances are your chances of doing well or not doing well, according to uh, your position in the social strata. So things like what your chance of doing well in education, doing well in work, having a good life expectancy, not falling ill, those kind of things. Marxism, of course, is your big sociological theory that you want to discuss when looking at class inequalities. Marxists are very much of the view that class is still important and that ultimately it's due to things like material inequalities. So the amount of money that middle class people have compared to working class, but also due to cultural inequalities such as how people live their lives. One type of a cultural inequality is what Bourdieu calls cultural capital. Cultural capital is basically the knowledge, the values, the experiences of the middle classes that can help them get a step up in life and get forward and keep ahead of the working classes. I mentioned as well the Old Boys Network. The Old Boys Network is the collection of people, connections, should I say, of people who have been to public schools, then to Oxbridge universities, and then who end up in very high status positions in their jobs. So classic example of people from the Old Boys Network would be someone like Boris Johnson, who's gone through that exact process. I'm not saying that the reason he ended up as prime minister is because he was the best person for the job. It might well have been due to the fact that he knew quite a lot of people and he'd been in that kind of connection of people for a long time. False class consciousness, another Marxist idea here. False class consciousness is effectively the idea that the working classes are not aware of how bad their position in society is. So it's like the middle classes trick us into thinking that things are not as bad as they are, because if they are, if the working classes work out how bad it is, we're going to kick off and revolt, and the work, middle classes don't want that. Affluent workers, so this is a concept introduced initially by Goldthorpe and Lockwood in the 1960s. It's a way to describe uh, the way in which working class people are becoming gradually richer through the increase in wages that are paid to them. And then finally, um, meritocracy. It's, it's a concept used by the new right and functionists to describe the ways in which society should be a classless system, because ultimately, if everyone has a fair chance of doing well and that hard work gets rewarded, there should not be any need for social class. There should not be any kind of issues with social class because everyone has the same chances of doing well. OK, so we're now on to a word on the exams. Now, again, I, I know I've said this in like every video, but this is the point at which if you don't study Educast GCSE, Carry on watching, of course, but just take everyone back to say with a pinch of salt because your exams will be a little bit different. If you do take EDUCAS or the WJEC, 
GCSE it rolls off the tongue so beautifully that one doesn't it then this is something that you should pay attention to because this will be directly relevant to you and this is what's going to happen in your exams now I don't know the exact questions but I am going to run through how it kind of works and an example question from a couple of years ago so Stratfif is a big topic in paper two what you need to know is the paper is made up of seven sections one two three four five six and seven those seven sections are equal to 100 marks now the Stratfif part of this makes up sections three four and five and that is equal to 49 marks out of 100. So it's a blue and big topic in this unit that you'll need to get your head around. Now, the types of questions you will be asked will comprise of two, four, maybe a five mark, but nine mark questions as well. And I'm going to give you a nine mark question now. Now, this question came up in the paper two in 2021, so a couple of years ago. And the question was this, discuss whether social class is still an important form of inequality in the UK, nine marks. Now, uh, usual thing here, I would suggest that you pause the video now and have a think about how you might go about answering that question. Think about the stuff that I've covered in this video, particularly those sort of theoretical views of Marxism versus the new right functionalism, um, Goldthorpe and Lockwood and Divine on the other hand and think about some of the key terms you, you might want to use in that. Now just going to go over a really quick plan for how you actually go about writing this. You want to be looking at writing about a page for this. You're going to need a brief introduction, doesn't need to be very long, a sentence. You're going to need to have a paragraph on the Marxist view, so yes they do see class as important. You're going to need to evaluate that, so you'll need to be able to criticise the Marxist view against uh, something else. You're also going to need to include a paragraph on the alternative view, whether that's the new right and functionists or the views of Lockwood, Goldthorpe and Divine, which is that ultimately social class is not as important as it used to be. But again, you will need to evaluate that and then you'll need to finish that off. If you want to get nine out of nine on these questions, you have to conclude it. So you have to put a short conclusion and that will need to answer the question. So take a moment, pause the video if you need to have a think about how you'd answer that question. In the meantime, I'm just going to flip over and I'm going to go through my answer to this question. Now, as always, this is not a perfect answer. There is a load of different ways in which you can answer this. However, having Mark for the GCSE exam boards, I would say that this is a nine out of nine answer. And it's not just because I've written it. So let's have a read through. Discuss whether social class is still an important form of inequality in the UK. Nine marks. Introduction, nice and simple, one sentence. Some sociologists argue that the UK has become a classless society, whereas others disagree. Initially, in that first sentence, I've said there's two sides to this debate, neither of them agree with each other. So that's sort of set out the question, first of all. Let's continue. The new rights sociologists follow a functionist approach in saying the UK is a meritocracy and that class should not be recognised or considered as an important form of inequality. They argue that people are better off now than they ever have been and that there's a growing middle class made up of people with higher incomes from jobs that may have traditionally been working class but now pay middle class salaries. I think I'm going to sneeze. Am I going to sneeze? Yeah, I think I am. Maybe not. <coughs> there you go. Uh, right, sorry about that. Bless me. A study that supports this comes from Goldthorpe and Lockwood, who found people working in car factories had become affluent workers, showing class lines were becoming blurred and less important than they once were. However, and that's my evaluation here, that however bit there is my evaluation, it's really important. However, Divine conducted a similar study and found that despite this, working class values and identities remained important to manual workers. So that's my argument against the fact that class is no longer important. Now I should have an argument supporting that class is important, which will come from the Marxist view. Marxists, on the other hand, will argue that class is important as ever, with inequalities in UK society growing. One example of where class inequalities remain clear is in education, where middle class children achieve higher than working class pupils, often as a result of material and cultural factors. Not only can middle class families better afford private education or educational resources for their children, they are also more likely to possess what Bourdieu calls cultural capital. These values, experiences, and interests can further aid uh, to possess. Oh, no, sorry, I've done that wrong. Sorry. These values, experiences, and interests can help further aid educational success and increase life chances beyond education, showing why class is still an important inequality. This is my criticism. Despite this, many children from working class backgrounds continue to perform well in education. Little conclusion, wrap it up, answer the question. Uh, there are different views around the continued importance of social class, while Marxists argue that class remains as important as it ever has been. 
the new right would now say that we live in a classless society. So what that does there is it just wraps that up. So let's just have a quick look over here and show you why of what I've included here to get the, uh, the full nine marks. I've got an intro, very short. I've got a paragraph on the idea that no class is not still important. I mentioned a sociological theory, the new right. I've gone all the way through this and given sort of key terms in it. I've mentioned the study from Goldthorpe and Lockwood as well to explain that and i've used the key term affluent workers my criticism so this is my evaluation this is where i get my some of my free marks for evaluation i've mentioned fiona divine study and how that working class identities were still important despite this uh impact of the affluent worker then in my marxism paragraph we've gone here we mentioned marxism of course thrown in the fact that it's not just due to people having money i've mentioned cultural factors as well i've name dropped pierre bourdieu and talked about cultural capital i've also talked about the impact that it can have on life chances beyond education despite sort of couching my example in education all the way through and again towards the end there despite this many children that is my evaluation of my marxist paragraph and i finish off with a little conclusion which just wraps up answers the question and just shows the examiner i know exactly what i'm talking about as i have done all the way through there we go lovely nine mark answer for you so um i've banged on a little bit too long on this video so i'm going to be very quick in wrapping this one up uh, what have we covered today we've covered an overview of social class is it important well there's an argument to say that it is that's according to Marxists. There's an argument to say that it isn't. That's according to functionists in the new right and supported by the work of Goldthorpe and Lockwood and Fiona Devine with their concept of the affluent worker. We've gone through the ten key terms of this video, so looking at things like class, income, wealth, life life stances, life chances, status, false class consciousness, the old boys network, uh, affluent workers, and meritocracy. And I've finished off by looking at a. Um, nine mark exam question and how you would answer that question based on whether or not social class is still important so that's been a longer video than i'd have expected it to be and my hair looks a little bit fuzzy now but never mind um hopefully that was a helpful one for you i know that's quite a tricky topic it's also one of the topics that i know that in the past it's quite easy for just to breeze over it a little bit so if your teacher perhaps hasn't gone through that as much uh, with you, then hopefully that's helpful for you. As always, uh, if this has been a handy video for you, if you've learned something, if it's taught you something, be a pal, whack a like on it, it doesn't take anything. Subscribe to the channel if you can as well. You can go follow me on uh, Instagram, Twitter, uh, what's the other one called? Facebook, uh, any of those kind of places. You can also have a listen to the All Social to Take One podcast. So if you've got Spotify or um, what do they call it, Apple music or iTunes or whatever they call it now just search all sociology all one word you can find me on there you can also if you want one of these delightful mugs you can pick yourself up a delightful I love all sociology mug just search eBay for all sociology all one word and finally if you're feeling super super generous you can always support me uh, financially by buying me a pint or a cup of coffee over at patreon.com so if you go to patreon.com slash all sociology and you can actually buy me a pint of, a pint of coffee we can buy me a pint of coffee if you want or you can buy me a small beer uh, either or, or not at all equally very very happy just with your support and just with the fact that hopefully i'm helping some of you with your exams which will be fast approaching anyway i'm going to sign off now uh, i've got another video coming up what are we doing next time oh my gosh it's going to be a massive one next time so you're gonna to have to stretch just strap yourselves in because we're going to have a look at all different types of uh, inequalities focusing on things like gender, sexuality, disability, um, and some other things as well that I've forgotten. But there's going to be lots coming up. So do keep your eye out for that. Put your notifications on. I'll see you in the next video. Thanks very much. Bye.